All righty, welcome to today's webinar, The Sound of Event Fundraising. Uh, thanks to all those of you who joined us here today. We're excited to share some really great information about, um, you know, preparing the sound, the proper sound uh, for your next fundraising event. Hopefully you have some uh, events that you're planning coming up here in the spring that we can help you out with. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Super. <laughs> Just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, all attendees are going to be on mute throughout the broadcast. Uh, we're not going. We're going to uh, distribute a recording of the webinar, uh, a link to view it uh, via an email after this is over. So go ahead and look for that. And if you have any questions, we definitely want to hear them. We have a Q and A session at the very end uh, where we'd love to hear those questions. Uh, you'll see a little questions panel on your GoToWebinar panel that you can uh, submit those questions at any point during the webinar, and we will answer them at the very end. Uh, you can live tweet us at WinspireMe or at Keith Fox Inc. using the hashtag Sound of Fundraising, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. With that, um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ian Loth. I'm the Vice President of Fundraising here at Winspire. We love doing these webinars and uh, welcoming very knowledgeable guests. Uh, today's guest is very knowledgeable in the subject of sound. His name is Keith Fox. He's a professional benefit auctioneer uh, for Fox Fundraising and Auctions up in Northern California. Welcome, Keith. Wow, what a setup. Thank you, Ian. Glad to be here. Great to have you. Uh, Keith here is uh, had a long history of benefit auctioneering and, and also sound management. He actually started as a DJ back in the 80s, so he has uh, <laughs> decades of experience working with sound at, at big events uh, like what you guys are, are preparing out there. So uh, he has a lot of great knowledge to share with us here today. Uh, before we get to it, Keith, tell us a little bit about Fox Fundraising and, and what you've been up to. Well, with a setup like that, man, that was great. Uh, yeah, the 80s were 80s was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, started way back in uh, 1982. Uh, my older brother had a prom at the high school, and uh, I'm like, I'll do it. And ever since then, the bug bit me, and I loved entertaining, loved playing music, getting people to do wild and crazy fun things. I uh, was a club DJ for about 10 years. I've uh, been working with sound design and building uh, sound systems for about 30 years. So it's 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 been a great it's been a real great fun ride. Uh, got into the auction arena entertainment uh, side of it uh, about in 2004. So but doing it ever since and been having a great time. So I, I appreciate being here, Ian. Thank you for having me. Great. So you've been uh, in fundraising for about 13 years now. Uh, you've had about 150 clients, and uh, as you shared, you've raised uh, just over five million dollars for nonprofit causes, which is fabulous. I commend you for that. Thank you. Yeah, so Fox Fundraising up in Northern California. For those of you who are not familiar with Winspire, uh, what we do is we put together incredible, unique experiences for you to include in your in your live and silent auctions. Uh, we've been in over 44,000 500 events globally. That's mostly in North America here. Uh, we've serviced over 85,000 satisfied winning bidders, sending them on these incredible experiences. And we've been happy to raise over $50 million for nonprofit causes since 2008. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with no risk uh, or consignment packages and how they work, uh, you, they're free to reserve for your event. Uh, any one of our over 200 experiences, which you can view at winspireme.com. You can sell them as many times as you as you want or as you can during the event uh, without putting down a penny. And then you only pay for the experiences that actually sell and raise money after or at the event. And you and you do that after the event uh, and you keep all the proceeds above the nonprofit cost. So um, check it out. Go to winspireme.com if you're interested in including some incredible experiential packages in your auction. But we're not here to talk about uh, travel and uh, auction <coughs> items today. We are here to talk about sound. Uh, so I thought I'd give you a, a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, as you know, Keith mentioned, he's a DJ with uh, a lot of perspective when it comes to how to run sound properly when it comes to an event. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, then we're going to talk about who should manage the sound when it comes to the night of the event. Uh, we're going to talk about microphones, speakers, and we're going to get into a little bit about room acoustics. So what considerations you should have based on the venue that you choose for your event. Um, before we get to it, I always like to start these webinars with a little bit of interactive polling to see uh, what you guys are thinking out there or uh, what you guys have got. So uh, first question, how many people do you typically have attend your main fundraising gala each year? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch the poll. Uh, you're going to see it pop up on your screen and you can choose. Uh, I want to know how many people are going to have an event at your, your biggest fundraising uh, gala this year. Is it 0 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 300, 
300 to 400 or 400 or more people. Uh, let us know uh, what you're planning for. We have about 70% people voted. I'm going to give you another few seconds here. Three, two, and one. So I'm going to close the poll, share some results. All right, great. Um, wow. All right. We have some big events out there. That's fabulous. Wow. 400 or more. That's amazing. Yeah. That awesome. um, yeah. A lot of uh, these big events, 100 to 200, that's that's pretty average. A lot of the events I've been to, 200 to 300. So we have a good little mix here. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of this, Keith? 35% of 400 or more people. That's significant. That's great. Cool. Yeah. Well, we, you guys, especially um, guys and gals out there who are running these big events of 400 more people, sound is especially important for you guys. So I'm really glad you guys attended here today. Right. Next, another question I like to ask, how many auction items do you typically include in your live auction? I always like to get this um, information just to see what you guys are doing out there just because it kind of always changes. I'm going to launch the poll right now. Do you not do a live auction at all? Do you have one to four items, five to seven, eight to 11, or 12 or more items in your live auction? Right, go ahead and submit your vote now. Got about half everyone in. Give it a few more seconds. Three, two, and one. Okay, great. Awesome. That is right in line with uh, with what we are typically seeing. It's about 8 to 11 items or, or 12 items. Looks like there's some active live auction participants out there. So that's great. Especially for the live auction, sound is absolutely crucial. So um, for all you folks out there who are running a live auction, have those items, it's important to, to, uh, to really support that live auction with quality sound, which we're going to get into here today. So let's get to it. All right. Thinking like a disc jockey. Uh, <laughs> yes, Keith here has lots of experience with uh, decades being up in the booth and um, on the mic, uh, interacting with large crowds. Um, so, Keith, I'd like to start by uh, sharing some embarrassing photos that I was very happy to get some uh, get my hands on from you. Excellent, uh, my friend. Well done. Well played. Yes. So, uh, starting back as a DJ in '82, so you've been you've been at this for a while. Tell us a little bit about your beginnings and and what, how uh, it, it imp impacted you know your your ability to, to produce sound at, at events. Oh my gosh, dude! I don't know if I can recover from those pictures you got there. Um, how do I possibly spin this? Yeah, um, started out like I said in in '82. Brother had a prom. Ever since then, got bitten. Loved entertaining. Loved having a great time with the crowd. Um, this is back when, you know, there weren't a whole lot of sound for, you know, what we called mobile DJ, that kind of thing. It was, you know, we really had to design our own sound system. So I was kind of, at one point I had, you know, five or six guys working for me, a, a big company. So it was on me to make sure all these guys had great, reliable sound systems to go out with them because, I mean, we can't have stuff breaking down. So I got a lot of experience in designing, uh, you know, speakers, amplifiers, you know, music players, that kind of stuff to, to take on the road um, with me. So this is way back before, you know, we even had, you know, auctioneers and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I got and then was a club DJ for about 10 years, you know, Black Angus, Bobby McGee's. I was entertainer of the year at Black Angus a couple times uh, and then worked at a place in Cupertino called Baxter's where they brought a new sound system in and I got to work with JBL and Crown on designing the system and putting that system in and the acoustics and all that kind of stuff. So I've had a really great time, really great time doing it. Had a real successful, really fun career as a DJ and I, I was really lucky to get to do what I, what I got to do. So I, I was awesome. really happy with it. That's fabulous. And so tell me a little bit, you, you kind of got into auctioneering a little later and it sounds like from our conversations kind of prepping for this webinar, uh, you kind of fell into it. It was kind of by accident. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, yeah, this is, I mean, I was back in the day before, you know, auctioneering was kind of, you know, the big industry it is now. 99% um, of the time, you know, nonprofits or, you know, these big galas or fundraisers, they'd hire a DJ to come in, you know, play music, do the sound, make an announcement kind of deal. And it was one of those, well, you're here anyway, have the DJ do it. And, you know, I had a different approach to it because I come from the entertainment side. I wasn't uh, uh, an auctioneer per se. I was just a guy out there having a great time, you know, high-fiving people and having just a lot of fun with the guests and it just it really took off for me because it was so different 
from what anyone was doing. It was more of a, hey, we're here to have a great time to raise some money, but we can also have some fun doing it. So I think I kind of fell into it because like I said, they were like, we'll have the DJ do it anyway. And I discovered it. then that bug bit me and it really took off from there for me. That's great. Yeah. And talk a little bit about um, the evolution of benefit auctioneering since you've seen it kind of since its inception, right? Uh, I know auctioneering and fundraising events have, have really been around a long time, but especially in the last 20 to 30 years, it, it's really changed as oh, far yeah. as, uh, you know, the fundraising events go. Absolutely. I, I remember, you know, doing sound and, you know, and DJ MC for, a quite a few events where they'd have a professional auctioneer come in. And this is back in the day where, you know, it was super fast, just blew through the items. People, they really had a hard time understanding, much less, you know, find out what was going on. And I, I, I saw the struggle on people's faces. I mean, some of these guys are really, really good, but, you know, they were, you know, car auctioneers or they were, you know, farm equipment or they were, you know, those real fast talking estate people that just their, their goal was to get through as many items as they possibly could as fast as they could. And I've seen it um, just, you know, as, as I have been doing it, where it's really kind of turned to more of the entertainment, the interactive entertainment side of it, or getting people involved and really getting people to kind of rally behind your cause and getting them engaged and that kind of thing. So it's been really kind of a fun thing from the outside looking in because I really wasn't in an, you know, I wasn't really an auctioneer insider. I was just, you know, a guy having fun trying to have people raise money. We raised a ton of money because I, I think of the entertainment approach that I took to it that was so different from what everyone else was doing at the time. That's great. Yeah. I mean, and it's so different than, you know, just calling bid cards and right. uh, trying to talk fast and selling as many times as you or as many items as you can. Right. Aux right. The right. benefit auctioneering is so much more about connecting it to the cause and getting people bought in and getting people excited. And uh, that, you know, it's it's taking your time almost a little bit on those items to really get the bidding up for the cause, not just about, um, you know, how much money can you get for this item? It's about how much money can you extract from the audience? So um, right. I love that, that you kind of got the outsider's point of perspective of, of this evolution. So, and, and you speak a lot about, you know, being an entertainer and approaching it like an entertainer. Tell me a little bit about how you do that. Well, I, I think for, again, for me, because I, I came from the entertainment arena, so to speak, and I was kind of thrown into auctioneering. I, I approached it as I approached anything else uh, is, you know, I want people to have fun because at the end of the day, people remember how you made them feel more than what, what they really did. And if you get them engaged and, and you get them having fun and you get them all hyped up and having a great time, they're going to give more. If you make them laugh, people, when they're in a good mood, they're going to give more and they'll rally behind your cause and you can kind of get them to believe and to buy into what you're doing. And so I just kind of took that approach and just had some fun with it. And I'm, my entertainment style is more, I'm more on the interactive side where I'm out there with the crowd. I'm not, you know, standing up on the stage behind the podium calling out the bids kind of thing because I didn't even know that existed that wasn't you know I'm used to being on the interactive side so I'm out there with the crowd or running through the tables and you know high-fiving the high bidders and you know making them feel giving them the recognition to make them feel like hey you just did something really really great and we really appreciate it so that was kind of my approach and that that's kind of what I've taken ever since then is is doing that and it's really really uh, been a, a successful approach for me so that's what I love doing and that's what people seem to respond to. That's that's great. It reminds me of a, a saying. Uh, you know, people will never remember what you said, though, but they'll never forget how they how you made them feel, right? Right. Uh, right. And that's so much of what an auctioneer's job is. And you know, we're gonna it's we're tying this back to sound. I promise. The reason I wanted to share this and and kind of share key story is is because you know a lot. Of, I see a lot of auctioneers nowadays who are out there and they they are coming around on just the entertainment aspect. But if you're searching for an auctioneer and you know you want to get that great sound system, it's important to uh, to really search for the right uh, person who's going to be able to engage with the audience and, and really uh, and really set the stage uh, and use that sound system to, to its fullest extent. So um, and I, and I, I will interject and I will say, and it's important to find an auctioneer and not me. I mean, there's, there's a few out there, but we're few and far between an auctioneer who really, really knows the value and can talk uh, intelligently about you know how to have good sound and can counsel you and kind of and you know and guide you through how to get good sound because a lot of people they just don't know right right 
And that's, that's great. And that's what we're talking about here today. So for all you listeners out there, um, you know, we can't stress, if you're here to learn about sound, you'd, you probably have uh, the need for an auctioneer out there. So make sure when you're doing that search, you, know, you get someone who's going to be able to, to entertain and, and use that sound system uh, to its full, fullest extent. And, and, and to that end, right, having an auctioneer and a good system is really how you get your event to, to really stand out above the, comp the competition out there, right? You really right. have a good, um, good entertainment piece, uh, which is going to get, you know, people really bought in and have a great time and make your event stand out. Right. Nowadays, yeah. we, and you know, I talked about this earlier. Nowadays, the, I mean, the, the landscape for fundraising auctions is so competitive now because it's such a, an up and coming industry, so to speak. And people are being pulled in left and right where, for their, their donation dollars. And mm -hmm. so when you get those people in those seats, it's even more competitive now to really, really try to get them to rally behind your cause and get them to believe and to buy into what you're doing because, you know, every week they have a different fundraiser that they're being asked to go to. So and the attention pan, uh, spans with social media and everything are so short. So right. it's really important that when you get them there, you really need to wow them. And the days of, you know, the auctioneers or whatever standing on the stage and just calling bids out, I, I, I think are gone. And totally. hand, hand with that goes – an incredible sound experience for them so that they really are immersed in the experience. Yeah. Giving the auctioneer the ability to walk around the crowd and, right. and, you know, not be hindered by, you know, a corded mic, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, right. And I can tell you too, as far as like standing out, you know, the events that I've been to, uh, you know, if you have perfect sound and well-managed sound, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if it's managed perfectly, they, they probably won't even notice, but they right. will absolutely notice if, if bad. you, if it's bad. <laughs> Right there, yeah. it's, it's going to stand out in the worst possible way, and uh, and you don't want that, right? So you want uh, everything to to go off without a hitch, and uh, and really support your auctioneer or MC or whoever's running the event um, with with this positive sound. So with that, let's let's kind of get into some of the more te technical aspects um, and strategic aspects of of managing sound, uh, starting with who. Should manage sound. And let me just say too, I wanted to make sure everyone got the. Uh, I hope everyone is fans of Sound of Music. I know I am, um, but I, I thought it was kind of a fun little play on uh, the Sound of Music here. Uh, so hopefully, you all enjoyed that. But well done, Ian. I like it. What's that? I like it. Well done. Good. All right. <laughs> um, as far as who should manage sound, let's start with uh, it. It depends, right? As with anything, when you're when you're organizing an event like this, it depends on the size and the scope. Um, but talk a little bit about what you usually recommend for your clients, Keith, as far as, uh, you know, um, what the what the size of the event usually entails. Right. I, and I, I, I think that a lot of times uh, a lot of these events will have like a band or a DJ or what have you. And we'll get into more of that later. But I, I think anything from like 100 to 150, you can kind of get away with, you know, having the DJ do it or, you know, having a minimal sound system there. You don't need to invest thousands of dollars. Uh, for sound because you can have a, a pretty decent basic system there and that'll give you good enough sound coverage. I think when you get over to 150 to 200 people is when you really need to kind of make that investment because I promise you good sound will triple what you, you'll make triple what you put into the sound with, you know, with revenue. It's just, it's just always the way it's, it's worked out. So I, I, I think anything over 150, 200 people, you're really going to need to invest in either a professional sound company and like we'll get into later or, you know, work it out where you've got a reputable DJ company or a great band that can help you out with that as well. Great. And we're going to address each one of those uh, situations here uh, very shortly. But uh, when when you do, let's say, and as we can tell from the poll, we have a lot of people out there who are, are running these events that have well over 200 people. Um, and so in their case, it's definitely a good idea to hire a professional sound company. What does it cost usually, Keith? Like for, for a company like yours or around the country, what have you seen? I know it can totally vary depending on the size, uh, the event, the number of people, but right. what are you typically seeing? You know, I, I've seen really good basic sound set, setups like you have there. We got, you know, two or three thousand dollars. It, it's when, you know, you get into events of like 400 people, you're going to have to run multiple speakers. They're going to be wireless. Depends. Do you need, you know, projectors? You need projector screens. I mean, how much of the AV do you really need handled? So I've seen it cost as much as fifteen thousand dollars. But sometimes that scares people. But, 
you're, you're looking at an event where you're, you know, you're bringing in, you know, a, a million and a half to two million of donation dollars. So that it, it's such a minimal amount to spend to make that kind of a return on your on your investment. So, but I, I, I would think for, you know, a good between two to 400 people, I mean, you can spend, you know, between two and five thousand dollars for something like that and really get a, a, a really good sound presentation and have it sound really, really clean. Yeah, the kind of the the wisdom or the prevailing kind of sentiment for our conversations is it's kind of just you get what you pay for, right? Uh, so if you Absolutely. pay more, you're going to get just, you know, you're going to get a lot crisper sound. It's going to be better. You know, your your space is going to be audited a lot better, uh, especially if you're doing a bunch of, like he mentioned, right? You have screens and you have videos, transitions, um, musical interludes. Um, you know, the more complex your agenda is, uh, the more you should invest in your sound. But uh, we Absolutely. wanted to kind of share the kind of the bare minimum right if you have the 200 guests looking at professional sound is is imperative and right. uh, i can't tell you i can't emphasize this enough if you are over that 200 person mark do not use hotel sound uh two things right don't use the speaker sound the ceiling speakers because they suck and also, um, sorry I'll, to be kind of crass, but they, Ian, they I, do. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll stop you right there. And don't ever use hotel sound no matter what, period. Yeah. I don't care if there's five people there. Don't right. use it. Use your use your own, right? Because it just it's not reliable. And if you go in with an in-house sound company, uh, the, the hotel, it's going to be more expensive than, than hiring your own, for sure. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and Though, and, and a lot of people don't, they don't understand is those in-house systems are they're good for that background music that the elevator music that they play at those old right. volumes in those right. ballrooms and they're right. made for you know those powerpoint presentations you know you get you got the 25 executives there and you got some guy going on for an hour and a half with a powerpoint presentation about you know last year's revenue that that's what those are designed for they are absolutely not designed for you know a crowd of 50 to 100 people where you're trying to you know get energy and gets you know and and, and, and communicate to that that kind of crowd of, of people just just stay away from them period that's such a good point about energy, right? Like if you're on the mic and you're trying to get people energized and you, you know, you start talking real heavy and you need that bass, you need that guttural kind of, you know, yeah. stomach, you know, from the stomach excitement that it gets people riled up. Those tiny speakers in the ceiling are not going to do it, right? That's why you need uh, and they're big, not designed for it either. Right, right. And we're going to talk, we're going to make some specific recommendations as far as what speakers to you here a little bit later, but I just wanted to, to pause on this. Um, and you can always get better value if you shop around a little bit and you find your own professional company to come in and set up the sound for you, especially because, you know, it's, there's, it's, it's pretty simple as far as what's, what's needed. Um, and before we talk about the, uh, before we get back into the kind of hiring that professional company, I wanted to touch on the, the couple things that you mentioned before. Um, you know, using a DJ or the band versus hiring a professional sound company. So um, tell us a little bit about when the DJ can manage. And I know it's actually changed a little bit and, and oh, people, man. you know, there's a little bit more skill out there. Right. And, you know, and, and the, you know, just from my world starting, I mean, I officially started in 1986. This is back when there was like nothing available. Now, technology is just advanced so much to where DJs now have incredible sound systems. And a lot of a lot of DJs now get into the business because, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of technical geeks and they love, you know, all that really cool equipment. And so uh, any good, reputable, larger DJ company is going to be able to come in and really do a bang up job with sound for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you shouldn't shy away with DJ um from, from a DJ company only because, you know, they can play a much bigger role for you in the sound. And when, when we say, you know, when we say that we also, I also want to say that I know a lot, a lot of nonprofits come in and, well, we're a nonprofit. We want to get free or we want to find the cheapest we can. And you really, 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 really need to get away from that jumping over dollars to save dimes mentality because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not saying you got to pay top dollar. I know DJ companies will work with you as far as pricing goes, but you can really find some great DJ companies out there that can come in and just do a phenomenal job with the sound because so much more that the equipment's so much more advanced. They have wireless speakers now. They've got wireless setups where they can put them and they're so unobtrusive. You won't even know they're there. And it's right. really a clean and professional sound and setup. I love that. What did you say? That saying was great. The uh, diverting, diverting dollars to Oh, I, and I, I see it all the time, and, and I understand them. I mean, I do it too. We're all consumers. I mean, I'm out there too. I mean, I'm what a single dad. What did you I'm say? A, I'm, I'm a single dad of a 15 year old daughter, so believe me, I get it. A lot of people they jump over dollars to save dimes, Got and it. Yeah, they yeah, cut yeah. these corners 
<laughs> when it really, in the long run, it hurts them because, you know, they get the free DJ who brings, you know, stuff from, you know, you know, 10 years ago. It's just, you know, to pay not top dollar, but to pay a good, fair, equitable price to a company, that means that this company is going to invest not only in their people, but in their gear as well. I love that saying that jump over dollars to save dimes. So in, and there's so many things, aspects of organizing an event where, um, you know, you, t you have to think about the return on investment, right? Absolutely. What is going to net you money, right? The decorations. Yes. It's nice. It'll add to the party vibe, you know, like the food. Yes. You know, but those aren't raising any money, right? Uh, the, but the sound that is going to raise you money because it, it gets it gives the uh, the auctioneer the people who are selling the auction items or doing the fund to need or the special appeal or the paddle right. raise the uh, the energy and the the capabilities to really get people excited. Like it's all yeah. about building excitement at these events and the sound is such a crucial foundation for that, right? And I'll interject there and I'll say that there's only two things that are going to be on on your revenue on your they're going to revenue line items and that's your sound system and that's your auctioneer because when the sound when you're doing the live auction you want the energy and when you're doing the funding need you want to be able to hear a pin drop because that's an emotional appeal totally. and if the sound system is stressed or it isn't clean or it isn't you know it isn't really nice then that's going to be a struggle and you're going to lose money i've seen it i, I can't even tell you how many times i've seen it and, right. and the hard thing about it is you never know until after the fact until after yeah. it's all done then you realize how important it was Totally. Yeah. It's one, it's one of the most common issues I see whenever I go to events is the sound is bad and it's right. just, it kills, it kills the energy in the room and it just, it pains me. And that's why that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this with you, Keith, is because it's just, it's such an important message to get out there. Okay, cool. We kind of got off track a little bit, but um, just a real quick on DJs. So DJ is different from professional sound company because uh, the DJs, you know, they are in their mixing boards and stuff. And um, so DJs can be good, but they're going to be more used to running sound for like a dance floor. So it's going to be kind of like localized sound you talked about. So let's right. talk a little bit about when, when a DJ can be bad. I, I, th I think a DJ is good for like, you know, when you don't want to have to bring in, you know, you don't have the budget for, you know, and you should make one, but and, and this is a fine line, but a DJs are great for, you don't want to go that extra, you know, and, and bring in a professional sound company. But and we and I touched on this earlier. DJs can be bad when it's like you try to find because you're a nonprofit, you want to save money, and again that jumping over dollars to save dimes mentality comes into play here. You're just trying to find you know the two, three, four, five hundred dollar DJ who's going to come in and oh yeah I can do it no problem. And you, you just you 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 can't afford. I, I know because I've run a DJ company. I know the bottom line, and you can't. A, a DJ company cannot afford to come in and give you the kind of quality that you're going to want and need for the revenue that you need on a budget. They just it, it just it can't be done. It's just it's just basic math. So, so moral of the story is: make sure if you if you have over 200 people, create a budget for sound. Right, that's at least two to three grand. If you're less than that and you're thinking about a DJ. Um, and you can't afford the two to three grand, you know, make sure you get a good DJ that's, you know, over a thousand dollars, 1500 bucks for a DJ Absolutely. will get you the kind of sound that you need. Right. But regardless, and, last thing you want to skimp on is the sound, right? Yeah, I mean, you, I mean it's, it's a broken record. We could spend an hour just repeating that. <laughs> I love it. Was that a pun? Did you just say yeah. a pun about broken records? <laughs> that was great. All, All right. right. Um, that's good. Um, okay, cool. I know. I know a lot of events they'll spend uh, so spend some money on on getting a good band, getting good entertainment, which is which is always fun, especially for you know after the event is over. Uh, what about the band managing the sound? Because sometimes they have a sound guy, right? Right. These these higher end bands are really good because they'll have a dedicated professional sound guy that runs their soundboard for them to make sure they're all in balance and that kind of thing. And those are kind of good because then you can t really communicate with the band and say, hey, look, you know, we need, a, you know, we need three, we need four extra speakers. Can you put them in the corners and on the side for side fill? I know with those, you know, 400 plus people events, you're going to need a minimum of six to eight speakers. And this is where these higher end bands come into play because they'll be able to have that and the sound guy is going to know all about that for you. But most of them won't, right? Most of them are just going to have right. speakers on, on the stage. Uh, the We have stage heavy sound here, right? All the sound's going to be localized on the dance floor. So it's right. not conducive with with having an auctioneer. So just be very careful if, you, uh, if you're considering this or if a band, uh, we, I, you know, you, you mentioned this a lot. You hear a lot of times the band will, bands will offer it. They'll say, hey, we can do the sound, especially if you're looking for 
you know, place to cut corners, pinch pennies. Um, you know, maybe the band can do it. Well, yes and no. Just make sure that you ask these questions. And yeah, I'll let you review them here, Keith. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> questions. So, being, I, I know. Yeah, I know. A lot of times. I know for me, I bring my own microphone because I use a headset because I like to be my hands free and I like to run around a lot. But a lot of auctioneers will just use whatever um, is provided to them. So just make sure when you talk to a band, oh, don't worry about it. We can do it. Great. Well, how many mics can you provide? Are they wireless? How many extra speakers? And what's the cost for that? Do you have a dedicated sound person that's coming to the soundboard? And I, I know, Ian, these are these are uh, great questions that you and I were able to come up with that, that yeah. these are these should definitely be asked. Cool. And, and if they don't have a sound guy or a sound board, uh, big warning signs that uh, right. probably not probably not the thing that you should be using, um, right. especially for a bigger group. So um, tread carefully here. Make sure that, uh, yeah, you trust them and, and, and you ask the right questions for the band. Yep. Last but not least, as far as who managing sound, auctioneers. Um, does this ever happen when the auctioneers manage sound? Do you ever manage your own sound, Keith? Um, you know, I, I do, but I, I and I, I'm going to backpedal and say I don't recommend it. There's like one small event I do every year that it's, you know, it, it's my daughter's middle school band uh, fundraiser. And, you know, I, I bring in sound for that and I manage it. And I, I and I only say that because I, I, I know what I'm doing after 30 years of experience. I know how to EQ it. I know how to set the volume. What you don't want is the auctioneer having to do it because in the middle of a live auction, you don't want to run it back to the soundboard to tweak the EQ or turn the volume up or volume down or, you know, optimize the room, you know, that kind of stuff. You, you really kind of don't want that. There's some guys that say they can do it, but I, 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 I and I, I don't even do it either. Either I'll run sound for an auction or I'll be the auctioneer. You really doing both is unless it's a really small event really low key i really don't recommend it auctioneers should be focused on one thing and that's uh extracting money, money right yeah. getting people getting people pumped up i love it absolutely all righty moving right along managing microphones this is actually a small detail but it can have a huge impact over the uh you know the course of the event and kind of the the pace and and, and all of that um it's such a it's such a key part how many microphones uh should people have ready for their event, depending on event size. Well, I, you know, again, I, I'm three at a minimum, and uh, a lot of times, a lot of basic setups. You'll have, you know, the podium up there on the stage, and that could be a wired mic because it's not going to move when people stand behind it. But you know, you're going to have a director give a speech. You may have, you know, someone else give a, you know, a, a few words kind of deal, and of course, your auctioneer. And what you don't want to have is that, you know, that, and we'll touch on it earlier, that kind of dreaded hat off or having to go out and find a microphone. I've had situations where they only had like maybe one or two. And, you know, the director had it in the kitchen. She laid it on the table. Now you're running around trying to find it. And and plus, if, you know, if you have, you should always have wireless microphones. If there's going to be interference or a battery dies, you want to be instantly be able to, you know, grab another microphone and just like, just seamless be able to kind of keep the show on the road. You know, the show must go on kind of mentality. What about, so we had quite a few people out there that are, you know, running these huge events of 400 people or more. How many mics should they have? Well, that would depend upon the amount of speakers or, you know, who's doing what. But I mean, in those kind of situations, I would have a, at a minimum two more than you're actually going to need for backup. Right. Because believe it or not, mics get lost. People sit them down, lost, like you said, right? They, they get guy, lost in the event. <laughs> or with, the, you know, the wireless now you've got, I mean, there's so much wireless stuff going on now and Bluetooth. You might have an, a frequency interference. You may have right. something like that. I would say of the all the events I've been to, I would say more than half of them have had a mic issue at some point in the right. night where yeah. they had to like, oh, something's wrong, and then they hand they're handed a second mic, right? Absolutely. And it's all it's you go, just have plan for it, right? Just plan on having a mic issue, and so backups are imperative, right? Absolutely. And you, you touched on this this earlier that that mic handoff. Um, such a, it's, it's awkward, right? It takes a ton of time. It, it, if you think about it over the course of the whole night, right? Those, right. you know, 30 second, Hey, okay, who needs the mic next? And they kind of right. they get done with their speech and then they turn their head around. Okay. Who needs it next? You always right. want that next person that who's going to talk to already have their mic ready so they can jump right in. I can't tell you how many times I, you know, you wait a good 10 to 15 seconds while they, they walk through the crowd, they hand the microphone on, it's, you know, and, oh, we don't need more mics, and they have one, and, yeah, you, you don't, yeah, so, yeah, you, you definitely want, 
you know, again, two to three at a minimum. And again, so much of this, and as I'm kind of, we're talking through this, it just reminds me, so much of this is about building energy throughout the night. You can kind of think of, uh, you know, your event night as one kind of arc, right? It's in the beginning, people are getting there, excited, getting drinks, and then getting to dinner, that energy's growing, 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 and you really want it to peak, right? Right at the live auction and the fund and need where people are just having a blast, laughing, enjoying themselves, clapping, cheering. And if you have to stop and you know, there's like uh, periods where you have to stop and hand the mic off or wait, then that's where the energy dies. That's where it starts to slow down. So making sure that those transitions are instant, the next person who is going to talk has that microphone is such a crucial part of having a seamless agenda uh, cruise through the night. Well, and a, a good analogy I heard, and I can't remember, another auctioneer said it at one of our uh, BAS summits that I went to, he, and I wish I could credit him. I, I, Anyway, he said, I mean, think of your auction or your event like a store. I mean, most stores are open all year round and, you know, they make sales as they do. You have your store open for one night. And yeah, the one night only storefront. Yeah. A year's revenue in that one night. So do you really want to spend, you know, an extra five, 10 minutes looking for mics or handing them off or having that awkward, you know, you, you don't want that. You got to maximize what you got. Every second counts yeah i i'm obsessed with that one night only storefront uh, metaphor because it's it's crazy like if you asked any business person to uh, run a business where they uh, were only open one night a year and they had all their products on the shelves and they had all their customers come in yep. and they had to sell everything and then say, see ya and lock the door until for 364 days, they would think you're crazy. They would never go into business. But hey, that's what you have to do as an event planner, yeah. right? right. <laughs> uh, it's no crazy, but it, so every single second counts. And so it's all about building energy, making sure the sound is perfect. And it's you could, like you said, you can hear a pin drop. It will all add to the uh, the momentum of the evening right and we kind of touched on this a couple times already but just talk a little bit about how important uh, wireless mics are well I, I think the only place you should have a wired mic is at a stationary like the podium or something like that I mean and that's really the bottom line for me and you want a high quality there I mean there's there's two kind of really trusted brands that I've seen uh, and that sure Microphones, that's what I've used. I've used Sure exclusively for 30 years and never had an issue. And Sennheiser are, are probably two of the brands if I want to throw out brand names. And those are just the only two, you know, Sennheiser's used at, you know, the uh, the, the the American Music Awards. You'll see them. Sure is used for the Oscars and the Golden Globes. I mean, those are, that's the kind of quality that you can, you can get from those particular brands of microphone. Anything else, an off-brand or whatever, I would stay away from just because of the dependability, the quality and reliability. Got it. I love it. And just, yeah, I mean, as far as wireless mics go, I mean, you want, and we've already kind of uh, touched on this several times, but just, it's so important to have the auctioneer out there interacting with the audience, you know, getting up, you not, you don't want them in people's faces, but you want them up next to them, like talking to them, like, you know, people love it when uh, the auctioneers right. out there and there's a bidding war going on between two tables and the auctioneers sitting there right in between going right. back and forth, you know, it's getting it going and people love it. Right. Yeah. You, you definitely don't want to tie up your auctioneer with a tether or a mic cord. That's like suicide. And do you and you usually use kind of like a, a lapel mic or, or a headset no. or what, what do you use? That, okay. You know, I'm glad you said that because it, you know a, a lot of I, I've seen some guys wear a lapel mic. Absolutely not. Those things aren't designed for the kind of energy and vocal transference that you know a, a handheld or I wear a headset. And that's a mic specially designed, you know, wear it on my head so my hands are free so I'm able to hold up items or, you know, high five people or run through and shake hands or pat on the back, that kind of thing. Um, some auctioneers, they like the handheld, but, you know, those are the only two that I recommend. You don't want to use the lapel mic. Those are, we talked about that earlier, those are for the PowerPoint presentation with 25 people going over your last year's sales numbers kind of thing in a real quiet environment. They aren't right. designed, the, 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 the headroom on those things isn't designed to do what we do. So stay away from those. Great. Yeah. And having that, that wired mic on the podium, I think one last thing is, is it also important, just kind of your ultimate backup, right? If, if all else fails and your wireless mics are just, you know, then you all, then you always have a wired mic that is, is guaranteed to work, right? Absolutely. Great. Okie dokie. Uh, moving on to speakers here. Speakers is such a crucial part about the sound because, hey, that's where the sound comes from, right? Right. So... <laughs> 
Uh, tell me a little bit about powered speakers. I'm sure you all, all our listeners out there have been to events where they've seen them, right? These are those kind of self-contained um, speakers uh, that are pretty pretty low maintenance. Tell me a little bit about uh, about how these work. Well, powered speakers, I mean, over the past 10 years have really kind of come in their own. They're kind of a newer technology where, whereas before you would have an amplifier and then the amplifier, you'd have to run really big, long, bulky cables to a speaker. That's called a, a passive system. Now we have what's called the active system where you have everything is built into the speaker, the amplifier and their digital amplifiers so they don't produce all that heat or have those loud fans anymore. It's really, really a neat deal where all you have to run to these speakers is 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 power and they can plug into a wall anywhere. So if you, you know, you've, you, and you've got power outlets all along the walls, pretty much wherever you go, you can plug them in anywhere and you just gotta run an audio cable to them. And you can even run some of them wireless. So the technology is is really kind of amazing now where the powered speakers are really, really the way to go and they're ultra reliable. You, you don't have, you know, you don't have them failing or you don't have, you know, problem getting sound to them because they can even run wireless at this point. So those are those are really neat. You see them everywhere and they sound just fantastic and they have a lot of power with those new digital amplifiers. So you really, I mean, you really can't, you, you don't, you're going to hear everything crystal clear with the powered, with the powered setup. So a couple, couple notes here. So if you're out there and you're hiring a professional sound company, right now you're getting armed with some of the questions that you can be asking. What type of do you have powered speakers? What type of powered speakers? Right? Are they right. wireless? You can start asking these questions to these professional sound companies and getting a feel for for their actual expertise. And hey, you know, there's places you can go rent the speakers if you want to take the sound on your own. Um, you know, you you can go rent these, um, but uh, but yeah, it, the, the whole point here is, is is you want to be armed with with the right information so you know what you're getting um, right. when you hire a professional sound company. Right. Agreed. And go for it. Go ahead. No, I was just some of the some of the best names in in pro audio would be you know like JBL, QSC. Um, you've got picture here are Mackies. I mean, there's, I mean, and like I said, the technology is just, it, it, I mean, there's, you really kind of can't go wrong. There's so many great, great systems out there right now. Great. And these, these are some more powered speakers here. There's a few kind of bigger speakers, but those ones kind of along the ground, or you probably recognize them at, at, at big events. Uh, how many, how many speakers should, depending on the event size, how many speakers do you recommend? I, you know, if you got a hundred more people, I, I would say a bare minimum of four and you just put, it's easy to do, put them in each corner of the room. I mean, it, it really isn't that complicated of a setup. I mean, it, it really is. You can run, you can run the two up front that are wired. You can run two wireless in the back, depending upon the size, uh, you know, of the room. And it, it, it just what you want to do is, is you don't want to have to blast people up front. And you, what you want to do is is create a nice, even, temperate sound throughout the room, so that way it kind of the sound kind of meets in the middle, and everyone has a comfortable level with it. I mean, there's been lots of times where I've gone, and you you literally have to yell in the microphone because the people in the back they can't hear anything, and the people up front are getting killed because it's just it's too front heavy. So you want that balance. I love it. I love it. And let's let's get in a little bit, dive a little bit deeper into this. So as far as placement goes, uh, you know, you want at least four, right? And then you want, like you said, two in the front, two in the back, and then at least six feet high. I think that's super crucial. Here you'll see a picture of, of those speakers on tripods. Right. There's these really sturdy tripods that you can put them on and you want them up high. Why is that, Keith? Well, you know, and there's there's school, two schools of thought on that. Really popular now are those um, what they call the, those those compact line array. Like Bose makes a system. A lot of guys like those Bose systems. A lot of guys like the, the new EVs. Uh, they're they're they have like a they're like that. They're really thin. They're really skinny speakers with a little base module on the bottom. The only issue with those is when you start putting those in corners of the room is they only they only come about like you know maybe four three and a half four foot high. And what happens with that is we you know when people are you know they're standing around or they're sitting that sound is like right at them right at their bodies. What you want to do is you want you want to raise that sound. Uh, so you can 
you don't have to crank it up to get the sound coverage that you would get that you that you need to get when those sound when those speakers are about six foot high they're above they're more or less above people's you know people's heads and because you want to you don't want this you know the sound firing at their faces especially when guests are seated because nine times out of ten they're going to be seated for your live auction and they're going to be seated for your fund to need so you want those speakers high enough where they're you don't have to crank them up to get the sound coverage you can put them at a nice comfortable level because it's above people's heads and people can hear it comfortably so yeah. That's why I recommend these particular systems versus those line array things that sit on the floor because then people's bodies absorb them. They absorb all that sound and you've got to turn them up that much more just to get the sound coverage that you would need. Great. So don't put speakers on the floor. You want them up high on tripods. Over you, you, people's heads. Over people's heads. That 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 sound waves can, can kind of go across the room. Uh, uh, yeah. You have some great visuals here of uh you know just a couple examples so 200 350 people uh having four speakers here's here's the sort of placement right one in each corner did you want to talk about this for a yeah, second I, yeah th those are good i mean this is a diagram i did and, and this is of course i mean 99 percent of the events that i do are more or less like this your event may differ but you may have a different setup but for the most part this is how it is you got a stage and you've got speakers kind of flanking the stage for people up front and then you want to make sure you've got speakers in the back i prefer corners only because the sound is a little bit better because it's it's firing out of that corner versus no space behind it but you can do it this way the bottom line is you want to have a comfortable sound level where it kind of meets in, in the middle, and I can't point my finger at it, but where it kind <laughs> of it's over people's heads, it's over the tables, it's a comfortable level, and you don't have to crank up the fronts or the backs. You can have them all kind of at the, at, at the same sound level, and it, it doesn't hurt people, and it, it's just a good, comfortable level for them, and it gets good sound coverage. Now we're Great. getting into the and this is 400 yep you definitely want six right. right so now we got two in front we, we have we keep our two in the front we keep our two in the back and now we've got what's called side fill speakers because again what you don't want to do is you don't want to have having more is always better than not having enough because now we're able to we don't have to stress the fronts we don't have to stress the backs because now we've got an, another pair of speakers to do the heavy lifting for us and we're gonna have a good, even sound coverage at a comfortable level. We don't have to crank the fronts or crank the back to you know to fill in for all those people we're gonna have. We're able to have six here now, all at a decent level to where people aren't, you know, plugging their ears or, you know, because you see these are by tables. So, and even when they're above people's heads, they can still get pretty loud. So that's what you don't want. You wanna keep them up high, or you can keep them at a nice, decent level where people can still kind of talk and be involved, but at the same time, they can hear you nice and clean. Love it. Great. Okay, our last section here, and then we're going to get some questions. We've got a couple of really good ones already. Um, room acoustics. And one, one thing, too, I wanted to touch on on this. Um, when you, before anyone has arrived and you're setting up the sound and you're testing it out, just mm -hmm. keep in mind that once bodies start filling in the room, that is going to dampen this, each body that adds oh, yeah. to the room is going to dampen the sound, right? So this, it might be pretty loud with no one in there and you have six right. speakers and you're like whoa this is more than i need but as right. soon as those you know a couple hundred people start getting in there the the sound is going to change dramatically right and you want to make sure that your sound guy or whatever as you see here in this diagram i call it the mic mixer system or the soundboard or whatever you want that guy facing you facing the stage i've seen someone will they'll put they'll put the, the sound person behind the stage and that's absolutely you don't want i mean and so i'm sure people know that but I've been to a couple where they, you know, they hide them off in the corner or something. You, you want your sound person out there in the mix with the sound. So not only can he hear it with, with his ears, but he's able to get a good comfortable level because he's out there with you. And what he's referring to is this little, the mic mixer person right, right here. Yep. Right here. Send it back. It's soundboard or whatever you want to call it. Great. All right. Room acoustics. This is a, an important uh, piece here. And, um, and, and we're getting a couple questions about outdoor events, which I'm excited to talk about um, here in the Q&A. But uh, let's start with just assessing the event space. Tell, uh, tell us a little about how you assess an event space uh, when you first see it. And what do you think about this picture here? Well, OK, and this is a great picture to lead off with, because I'm sure a lot of you have events in these kind of rooms where you've got you've got the plaster walls you've got cement floors you've got these really high cathedral ceilings as you'll notice and you probably can't see it but you'll see two little speakers on the side there those are your side fill and i'm sure there's two 
Uh, in the back, and there's two that you can't see kind of behind us if you're in that picture as a 3D perspective. These are tough rooms. And as you'll see here, there's nothing in, in there to dampen the sound. And I liken it to, I don't know if you go to church or not, some people do, some people don't, but if you go into these newer churches, especially the evangelical ones, you will hear incredible sound systems because they got the band, they got you know the the, the light shows and everything, and it sounds phenomenal. But if you look closer, you'll see carpeted floors. You'll see uh, seating. They don't have the wooden pews anymore. They've got, you know, the fabric seats. They'll have, you know, sound dampeners. They'll have acoustic tile. And you begin to look for that kind of stuff. Those are all sound absorption stuff. And that's why it sounds so good. So as you attend these different stuff, you'll kind of get an eye for the technical stuff and what can help you to make your whatever event space you're going to have sound even better so this is a, a real difficult room here because you're going to see you know all all those hard cold surfaces that, that sounds going to bounce off of right right and and um let's talk about that actually yeah sound bouncing Boun bouncing sound is bad bouncing sound bad <laughs> and that's that's yeah, because yeah, that's of, yeah. yeah it's it's echo right it, it right. you can see there's a lot of hard walls and those sound waves are just going to bounce off of everything right right and, and sometimes you and sometimes you can't help it, but right. in, 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 in that would would tie into, OK, well, if you've got I mean, say you've got that room, you need to put a lot of bodies in there. That's a good room for like 500 people. And as you can right. tell, there's a ton of people in there because then they're going to act as sound dampeners for you and it won't be as bad. And you and you mentioned too, like uh, when you're kind of in those those churches, um, and even like in hotel um, banquet rooms, you'll see you talk right. about sound dampeners. Those are those kind of cloth squares. Uh, right. You'll see kind of funky designs on the wall, just kind of these yep. big panels. Uh, they're like kind of cloth covered. Those are That's those awesome. are very specifically designed to absorb sound so that it doesn't bounce around the room. Right. Exactly what they're for. They're, but, they're but, room acoustics. But what I'm seeing, what I, I've been to several events now where, especially these days, everyone's trying to, you know, one up each other and, and take get to these uh, unconventional uh, spaces, you know, do it in a barn or do it outside or do it in, you know, kind of like an atrium. Uh, yeah. it, all these things pose their own ch unique challenges for, uh, you know, managing the sound so that it doesn't bounce around, right? If you have a lot of rock or uh, right. things that are hard, right? Um, uh, what are, are some things you can do? I got some great, I have tricks that I, I, I tell my clients and and that's, you know, pipe and drape. And I think your next picture will show um, is you can have, <clears throat> excuse me, pipe and drape is like, the god save it, it is like the ultimate trick to absorb sound and it looks really clean it looks really nice if you've got those blank cement ugly walls you can put you know some pipe and drape along those walls and up light them and they, it brings the room up a hundred percent and it takes your sound to a whole different level and those like are that. great pipe and drape is like a lifesaver now here the picture on the left is <clears throat> i believe it's an event i did several uh, a couple years ago where like well what can we do we have these really high ceilings and i said well here's what we can do why don't you just take um <clears throat> take some you know some fabric and you can drape it from the ceiling and that's exactly what they did and that helped the sound out tremendously because now as loose as that fabric is and it, it looks like it really kind of you're like oh what good does that do it does a lot because it keeps that sound from going up into the ceiling and bouncing around there and firing back down it absorbs the sound for you and it looks great. I mean, I, I love the look of that, right? And, and this is actually, this is this is something that a professional sound company is going to help advise you on, right? Is right. is uh, they're going to look walk into a space like this and say, "Oh my gosh, there's huge ceilings and no sound dampening." We're going right. to I recommend draping some some cloth to to really help uh, to right. really help rein that in, right? Yes. It looks great and it, and it's, it it serves like a, a, a double purpose and it and it really really works. And we're getting a couple, I'm going to get to the couple specific questions uh, here during our Q&A, but what do you recommend for outside? Usually, outside, you know, outside is tough because then you've got sounds got nowhere to go. Right. So in, in those kind of situations, that's where it's really super important to surround yourself with sound. Sound that's, you know, if you just have, you know, front sound or just front and back, that's where it's really important to have, you know, the front, the side and the back sound, because then what happens is the sound all comes to the middle and kind of cancels out. Mm. That would be that that's the way to do that, because when you're in an outside environment, <clears throat> you've got maybe maybe two, maybe four speakers. What happens is, is that sound, it just throws out there and it kind of keeps on going. 
There's right. nothing, have, going, yeah. nothing to stop it. Right. So that's why it's always good to have to surround yourself with with the sound system or speakers or whatever, however you're going to do it. And that's why you'll see <clears throat> in these really large venues, you'll see these speakers, but they're called flying speakers. Mm. What that means is they're mounted up on the stage and really high on wires and they're firing straight down. And that gotcha. way, because that way what happens is when the, the sound fires straight down, the bodies absorb it and the ground absorbs it. It doesn't just keep on going. It's those kind of ones that are kind of an arc and they're, they're hung up. Yeah. Um, see and that so, on really high end stuff. Concerts, like concerts and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so interesting. So, and um, let me, yeah, with that. Okay, cool. We'll get some, some of the specific questions that I, that I want to get to here real quick. Um, um, as far as this webinar goes, that that's the extent of it. I want to thank um, uh, Keith for, for coming in and sharing his knowledge uh, all about sound. Uh, stick with us for a couple minutes. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, managing a couple of specific uh, outdoor events. But if you want to know more about sound, uh, you know, just you want to pick Keith's brain or you're interested in having him come out and do an event for you, you can absolutely reach him here, Keith at foxfundraising.com or his website, foxfundraising.com, or his phone number is there, 800-828-9599. Uh, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Um, as exactly. far as Windspire goes, we'd also love to hear from you if you have an auction coming up and you're, you have a, a live or silent. We'd love to get some experiences set up for you and uh, something that your donors would love. Uh, you can check out our full catalog at windspireme.com. We also just released um, a new line of luxury properties. Uh, some of you might have been familiar with that last year, but this is specifically for the lot silent auction tables. They're boutique hotels from per preferred hotels and resorts from around the world. Beautiful properties that we're, we're selling uh, at a no risk basis. So check those out. Um, and Winspire News, great resource. It's our blog. Uh, we come out with weekly articles all about stuff like this, sound, uh, new webinars, and we have a, a quarterly drawing for um, all of our subscribers. So we uh, we just we're actually announcing our, our January first winner here in the next couple of weeks, and we're going to have another drawing here coming up on March first. So definitely subscribe. And Fantastic place for for great great timely you know news and, and tips you can use. I use it. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for that, Keith. And then uh, we have our podcast, Events with Benefits. Uh, great. We had Keith on there, actually. Um, he, I think his episode's actually coming out this month. So um, check that out wherever you get your podcasts. Search Events with Benefits, or you can check it out at eventswithbenefits.com. And with that, let's answer a couple of these questions. I think these are uh, really interesting. And if you have any questions about sound that you want to ask, now is the time. Um, I have one from Carrie Kibbe. Uh, we have an outdoor event with over 850 people. We use a DJ and he is great for the centralized activity area. We have always struggled with sound for the actual race start. We only need solid sound for a short intro, 15 minutes at the, at the race start. Do you have any suggestions for this? We currently have two speakers and one mic we use. Should we have extra speakers to use along the race start line? Wow. So we have, you have 800 people and you've only, you're, and if I'm understanding this correctly, 800 people with only two speakers. Is that what I'm understanding? I guess so. I guess so. It sounds like they have a kind of a separate DJ area. And then uh, she said, yes, please don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, gosh. Not judging. Well, that answers it. So, so I, I, I'm going to tell you, probably the, the, the first lesson we're going to learn is you obviously need more speakers for better sound coverage. Because probably got what's it. happening is the two you've got, you're cranking, just just killing to get the sound coverage you need but if you added maybe you know two or you know added two or four more i think you'd have a lot a lot better sound spread a lot better sound coverage and if you have a dj there who's really good he even could probably provide that i don't know if he's playing into a system that's already there or if he's providing all of that but you you may want to talk to your dj about better sound coverage or like we talked about before bring a professional sound company in right they can, right. They can do that for 800 people that's a lot of people Right. Carrie's saying here, so she's saying we're a small nonprofit. He provides his own. Um, uh, what I, yeah, I guess what, what I'm gathering is like, you just need more speakers, right? And you need more um, coverage. More so, especially if you have everyone bunched up right at the starting line, right? 850 people there. Um, you know, you're going to need more than oh, just a couple it, to, a to reach all those folks. What's that? Is it a race, like a, like a marathon or something? That's what it sounds like. It sounds like a 5K walk or something. A gotcha. 3K. Okay. A 3K. Carrie's uh, okay. communicating so, via the, the question pane here. Um, so, so I, I can't see the questions, but um, it sounds like you've got like, okay, so there's eight or people all bunched up. It sounds like, okay, yeah. So the solution to that is easy, is just 
uh, just a few more speakers for better sound coverage, and you'll, that 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 would solve your problem. A few more of those powered speakers. Make sure they're up high, right above everyone's right. heads, and you up want high, them at the uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. yeah, distributed out. And do you, I think the thing that you said really uh, uh, nailed it when you said you want to surround, uh, especially when you're outside, you want to surround the people with with the sound as opposed to just blasting it at them, right? Right. Absolutely. You bet. Cool. Thanks for that question, Karen. Good luck with your race. It sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, oh, this is just another one. Laura Reynolds, our event is outside. What additional vibe for you have for this setting? It's uh, just surrounding those folks um, with the sound. So that's that's great. Um, any other questions? We'd love to hear them. Um, but with that, I mean, I think that's, we've pretty much covered everything. Did you want to add anything, Keith, uh, for yeah. our webinar today? Who is, and I, I can't see panelists, I can't see questions, but who do we have that's from the furthest away? Do we have anyone that's from like not, not the United States? Do we have anyone that's from like another country listening in today? I saw a few people from uh, British Columbia in Canada. We have a lot of some East Coasters over in Massachusetts, New York. Um, but uh, yeah, all over the United States today. The, it sounds from like the there's a lot of people who are curious. Contact me and I'll send you a Starbucks card for the furthest Ooh. person away. Nice. <laughs> buy your coffee for you for tuning in. There, there you go. I love it. I love it. If you, if you have any questions out there uh, about sound, again, Keith, Keith actually has a great um, resource that uh, it's just kind of a, a how-to guide. It goes into some, some more specifics about what wireless mics to use, what uh, powered speakers to use. Um, you know, dives in a little bit more about you know the the, the piping and drape. Um, so we'll provide that in, in the in the email that we send out with the recording of this webinar. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank Keith. Uh, so much for coming on and sharing his knowledge today. Thank you, Keith. You bet, Ian. Appreciate you having me, man. Really. Awesome. Anytime. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us out there. Uh, please stay tuned for more free webinars coming up very soon. Take care now. You bet. Thanks, Ian.